I want to introduce uh, one of God's children. Her name is Kim Porter. She's our guest speaker. Uh, there's a very impressive uh, description about all of her accomplishments. <laughs> She's a very accomplished person, um, and we're very privileged to have her. She does uh, teaching and training all over the country, and uh, she now serves as the executive vice president, chief of staff, uh, to the president of InterVarsity uh, Christian Fellowship, Tom Lynn. And uh, I don't know if you know this, but Kim was part of our church along with her husband, Eric, when Kim was working with InterVarsity in the Northwest. And so she's a former Lighthouse member and uh, <laughs> really glad about that. And she and Eric were a very important, vital uh, part of our church until they moved to Madison in, in 2014. But ever since then, she's always made herself available uh, when we have called upon her to come and do some speaking or training for us. So one thing I would say about Kim is, uh, as accomplished as she is, she's just a humble servant of God, and she also is a child of God, a servant of God, and a follower of Jesus. And I love the way that she has offered up her life and her gifts, as well as her knowledge and expertise uh, to share with us. So I want to uh, really thank Kim for being here and for your generous spirit to share with us. God bless you. Yes, I am excited to be back. I have been in this setting in Sambika in the Northwest. We would host student conferences here, so I remember praying behind the scenes for the night when we would do a call to faith and see what non-Christians might stand in this space. So this feels like holy ground to return to, as well as coming back home here in Seattle with you all. So when Eric and I moved to Seattle, it's true, our first Sunday, we went to Lighthouse Church. There's a whole story of why a lot of InterVarsity connections and a number of people said, Lighthouse, Lighthouse, Lighthouse. So we went. And that first Sunday, we sat next to Mei Ling's husband, Sets, and he was this welcoming presence. Oh, have you been here before? Are you in a small group? Uh, nope, it's our first Sunday. And he said, well, let me come and introduce you to my small group. And so that Sunday, we met Al and Evco, we met Cheryl and Norm Chang, and they invited us. I think that Friday, we were in their small group. <laughs> so a marker that I would say of Lighthouse is your hospitality, your welcoming, and your sense of looking for the one who is new in the room. How do we create a place for that, that new couple, that new individual to feel welcome? And so thank you for the ways that you did that. And who would have known that on that first Sunday, what it would mean to be a part of Lighthouse? So yes, you, you'll see a couple of different things. One, I was in an amazing small group. Also made connections with Pastor Barry. So he's no longer here, but at the time, he was a former InterVarsity staff. It was one of the reasons why we heard about Lighthouse. And he knew of my Bible study uh, background, and so he invited me into his discipleship initiative, and we did a number of dig-in weekends, helped him create a year-long study in the book of Mark, so I got to walk alongside Pastor Barry. As well, I was invited to the women's small group that Patty leads, and that became a rich place of sharing our prayers, walking together through life's journey, and I discovered this thing called the STP. My husband is a cyclist. I am not, um, but he thought it would be so fun. The STP, if you don't know, means Seattle to Portland. You ride your bike. And there was a group that said, Kim, would you like to, well, actually, Eric, would you like to do this? Sure, we have a tandem, I'll bring Kim along. <laughs> <clears throat> Little did I know, not only were we gonna do these 200 miles together, we were gonna do it in the one-day group. Mm. Yeah. So I'm a one dayer in 200 miles. The next year, I decided, no, no, no. I'm gonna do it the normal way. And in fact, I got an award at the end of the STP for the spa-like experience. <laughs> because I decided I don't want to go up that hill. I will ride in the car. And I just had a sense, like, this is gonna be delightful. I'm pretty sure in this picture, I didn't, I hadn't ridden the last 20 miles. That's why I look so good. <laughs> oh, time for a snack, right? So that was my Seattle to Portland experience here at Lighthouse. You gave me the freedom to be what I needed to be. I am not an athlete, so I had a spa 
my experience. Again, thank you. You will also see that um, Pastor Nancy, I found myself, whatever she was up to, I kind of got roped in. <laughs> That was good, right? Whatever that meant, whether that was, oh, there's prayer ministry happening, let's learn about that. We're thinking about outreach. Kim, can you do what you do with InterVarsity? Sure, right? There was a lot of like, can you? I would love to. So there was a consistency of being invited in and invited in. And towards the end, I asked Pastor Nancy, is there a people group at Lighthouse that is not being served? Eric and I feel like we are filled up to overflowing, having been in Al and Ev's small group for the last four years. Is there, is there another people group? And yes, indeed. It was either new married couples, young married couples, and especially those that had little kids. Kim, would you and Eric gather some other veteran married couples and host a team? Where, where we had to land childcare every week so that there was a lot of little people running around, that they would be safe. But it was a time for us to gather and invest in the next generation. And so again, a gift to be able to use my gifts. I want to pause and just, it is a privilege to come back at this moment in the midst of this transition. As Pastor Wayne transitions and Pastor Joe steps in. What an incredible moment, a space of holy ground. I have spent the last 20 years, I would say that one of the things that I major in is organizational change. Coming alongside regions, inner varsity, nonprofits, and churches. How do you go through change? How do you lead through that? You can, if you knew my bookshelf, right, if I had a picture of that, you would see I have an entire library that's devoted to this topic. And there is one book in the midst of all of them that has stood the test of time, which I will be referencing today, and that is William Bridges' Managing Transitions. And what Dr. Bridges would say is it's not just about change. Change is the technical work on your Lighthouse website. It will mean a changing of the photograph and the name of who's the lead pastor. It might mean at your office you change the door plate, right? That's the change that's going to happen in this leadership. But what the transition is, that's the psychological work. That's the inner work of what does it mean for us? What are we letting go of? What are we entering into? Who will we become? What is God doing in the midst of this place? Now Bridges talks about three different phases. Yep. And so there's the ending, the neutral zone, and the new beginning. These three phases will mark our day together. Each session will focus on a different phase. And I have vital behaviors that you can pursue in each one. Because I want to say up front, one of the things in being a, someone who has studied and pressed in to the idea of organizational tra change and transition, it is not a guarantee that you will make it to the other side. Many, think about different changes that you might have seen at work, that you had some visionary, hey, we're going to do da-da-da-da, and then it fizzled out. It's because there are some vital behaviors that you have to pursue and be consistent doing. So I want to offer those to you so that you can hold them together, and the Lord will bring you through these three phases. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's start with the first one, the first phase. And that is ending. Go ahead. Click. Yep. The ending is you have to start with letting go of what you knew. You can't start the new thing until you have let go of the old. Okay, three. Yep, there you go. Before you begin something new, you have to end what used to be, right? I was purposeful on having a door. There is a door that's opening, but there also is a door that will close. And one of the key moves in an ending is acknowledging the loss. 
So I want to share a story of what it was like for me in my transition. Pastor Wayne named that I'm in a new role. And to embrace that new role, I had to let go of what was in the old role. So I started this new job in July. In June, I did all the paperwork for all the people that I supervise. Right? I moved to my office, set up my new bookshelves. That was all just the change. The internal work was when I entered in and felt the loss. And it happened in a very physical way. At our national service center on the second floor, we have what's called the training rooms. And on one side are all windows looking out. And on the internal wall, it's all glass. So a wall of glass. And I happen to be down on the second floor. And I notice there's a group of 60 people in, and they're having a rockin' time in that training room. There's someone up front. It's dynamic. There's laughter. And I looked again, and it was my old team. They were having their quarterly meeting that I used to lead. I didn't even know it was happening. And the, the, kind of what hit me in my gut, they have moved on without me. Honestly, if you wanted to go, I wish they were like weeping and lamenting and oh, there's Kim, come back, right? No, they didn't even notice that I was there. They had moved on and I felt it profoundly. And as I stood literally on the outside looking in, I felt the loss of stepping into this new role. Because where they were inside, and the person standing behind the podium, I felt competent in that role, being the trainer, the one who shapes the culture, who leads the group forward. That place, I knew how to do in my new role as the chief of staff serving the president of the organization. It was the first time he had had a chief of staff, the first time I was a chief of staff. I felt totally inadequate. And so again, the loss of knowing and, and I could do the old job, can I do this one? And feeling the profound loss of the team because I had raised up the leadership team that was in that room. I'd shaped the culture. I'd set our agenda and our, what the Lord was doing. On this new role, they all had been together for years. I am the new person coming in. I have to learn their culture, their ways of working. I have to press in to build the partnerships. It wasn't until I was honest with the Lord about all of those losses that I was able to fully enter in and even begin to think about being successful in a new place. You have to let go and acknowledge the loss before you can move forward. And so, I just want to name Lighthouse to ensure that you have a successful leadership transition. You must begin by acknowledging the loss of Pastor Wayne's transition. Okay, let's just hold that together. Many of you have sat under Pastor Wayne's teaching, right? You might have been married by him, baptized by him. You might have gone on a summer mission trip with him that was life transforming for you, right? You might be a new believer and the only church that you know is Lighthouse under Pastor Wayne's teaching. You have to acknowledge what is that like to say goodbye to that portion of your journey as a Christian in this congregation. And I want to name and be mindful. In every transition, even positive ones, you have to name the loss. When I uh, counsel new couples as they're getting ready to get married, I spend a whole session. I'd like you to come in and do your homework. What I need you to name, what are you losing as you move from a single individual to a married person? And they're like, no, 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 it'll be great. Nope. You must recognize the losses. Let me help you. 
You will no longer have your own bank account. You can't decide on your own financial decisions. You need to work together on how you will make major decisions, where you will live, who will be your community, how will you do family. You can't make any of those decisions on your own anymore. That's just one loss. Let's keep going, right? You have to recognize the loss so that you can enter into this new incredible season that the Lord has for you as a married couple. It is the same in this transition. It is not dishonoring to Pastor Joe for you to step in and name the loss connected to Pastor Wayne. And so in, if, for those of you that haven't opened your booklet, if you turn to page eight, I just want you to take a moment, just right now, because we're all in it, right? And jot down what comes to mind as you consider the ripple effect of Pastor Wayne's conclusion as your lead pastor. Can you name some of the losses for you that are connected to that transition? I'm just gonna give you a minute, jot down what comes to mind. I'm guessing that's just the beginning, right? I've just prompted you and maybe even opened up your heart and mind to think, oh yeah, there will be a lot of loss. There'll be more time to continue processing, but I just wanted you to start holding that. Rather than simply offering you key points from this business book around transition, I'm gonna invite us to enter into God's story to track with the Israelites as they went through a significant transition. Walk with them and see what we can learn as they went leaving Egypt and heading into a promised land that the Lord had given to them. So again, in your booklet, we have the scripture story printed out. I'm gonna invite you as you hear this first part, pay attention to God's intentionality as he leads the Israelites. We learn, before you have it here, we learn earlier in chapter 13 that God tells Moses he's very intentional. I'm not going to lead them through the short way because that would be through Philistine country. And I'm quite sure that if they had to face the Philistines, they would turn around and head back to Egypt. So I'm going to head them, lead them the long way. Okay, through the desert. So here we go, okay? So we pick up the story towards the end of chapter 13. By day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night, in a pillar of fire to give them light, so that they could travel day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. And Moses said, the Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites to turn back and encamp near pi Hacheroth, between Migdol and the sea. They are to encamp by the sea, directly opposite Baal Zephon. And Pharaoh will think, the Israelites are wandering around the land in confusion, hemmed in by the desert. And I, I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will pursue them. But I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army. 
and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites did this. Now, as we pick up this story, the Lord calls an audible. We're headed in one direction. Now I'd like you to turn around. The Egyptians are not going to understand what's going on. They'll see that you're confused and they will interpret it that they are lost. And I'll harden Pharaoh's heart and gain glory. Now, in this story, you might have noticed a couple different places. The reader would know what the author, where those places are. They would understand the GPS directions that are being given here. Okay? It would be like if I said, head to downtown Seattle on the waterfront and have your service out on Pier 66 looking over Bainbridge Island. Right? Do you have a picture in your eye what that means? It's the same. This is what it looks like of where they are headed. Pihacharoth is the craggy mountain range. Migdol is the Egyptian citadels or fortress at the top. It's where their armies reside. Baal Zephon is on the other side. The Red Sea is in between. Now, they are camping in this valley. Has anyone ever read a battle biography or seen a war movie? Anyone? Anyone in the room? I am not fluent in this, but I, can, I do know one thing. Being in a valley is the worst place to be in a battle. Uh-huh. Now, mind you, they were not lost. They did not get here by accident. The Lord led them to this place, and they are camped out here. Just take that in. And what do you know? The Lord's plan worked. We find in verse 5, when the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds and said, what have we done? We have let the Israelites go, and we've lost their services. So he had his chariot made ready, took his army with him. He took 600 of the best chariots, along with all the other chariots of Egypt and the officers over all of them. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, so that he pursued the Israelites who were marching out boldly. The Egyptians, all the Pharaoh's horsemen and chariots, horsemen and troops pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they camped by the sea near Pihacharoth, opposite Baal Zaphon. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were all the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Was it because there was no graves in Egypt that you brought us out here to the desert to die? What have you done bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone. Let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Mm. As you imagine yourself camped out in the valley and you hear rumbling and you look up. <laughs> the best army on the planet is barreling down upon you. The best war technology in chariots they have used against you. And who are you? Unarmed refugees. What are your chances? Right? You are trapped. You are stuck. And you might think, um, Kim, why are you bringing us to this valley as part of our transition? For the second vital behavior. Not only do you need to acknowledge the loss, but you need to understand the larger context within the transition happens. I would argue that the last two years have set your own valley of transition. You can go ahead and click us to the blank one. Yep. 
right? The last two years, what have you been in? COVID, a global pandemic, like nothing anyone has seen or experienced. I am tracking that we are, many of us still wearing masks. It was quite awkward being on a plane coming here with the mask down, and I think half of us were like, can we really take it off? You felt it viscerally in the plane. Is it safe yet? We've been carrying that around in our persons for the last two years. And COVID has had an implication on our work. Whether you are on the front lines in the medical field, whether you are a teacher who's had to recreate all that it means to educate our kids, or simply your work went remote and it meant your office was on your dining room table. We have been in significant change. COVID has made us understand what it means for our families. For those of you who have elderly parents or you're immune compromised, right? The weight of the fear of what could happen. For those of you that are parents and have young kids, before there was a vaccine, what's gonna happen to my kids? Are they safe? <laughs> or just as parents and you're now the principal, the daycare worker, right? You're all the things as you're trying to get your job done in your house. Or if you're a single person and in quarantine, you found yourself completely isolated. And lastly, church, lighthouse, what used to be an embodied experience. What has it felt like and been like to be online at the end of a week when you've been on Zoom calls all week long and I'm just so tired of being online? My small group, we don't get to sit around and have a meal together anymore. We're on Zoom, we're little boxes, right? Two years you have been in this valley and now comes the transition from Pastor Wayne to Pastor Joe. Did it happen in happenstance? Did anyone not notice that this was COVID? No, the Lord has been very intentional to leading you to this place. There is a third behavior in the ending, and that is the very thing that Pastor Wayne said, clarifying what is changing and what is not. What is not changing in this transition, the Lord God Almighty is the one who is seated on the throne. The Lord God is leading you he will take you through every step that you need to go. And as we return to our Israelites, Moses knew that. The people, you heard them screaming, why didn't you just kill us in Egypt? This is the, how can this be? And listen to Moses' words. Do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You only need to be still. Again, there's nothing in my person that would want to be still as Pharaoh's chariots are barreling down upon me. And yet there is something that Moses knows. And then Moses said, or the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water, and the Israelites can go through on dry ground. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so they will go in after them, and I will gain glory through Pharaoh and all his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I gain glory through Pharaoh and the angel of the Lord, who had been traveling in front of the Israel's army, withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved from the front and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to one side and light to the other, 
So neither went near the other all night long. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided. The Israelites went through on dry ground and with a wall of water on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued them, and all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. And during the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and the cloud and the Egyptian army and threw it into confusion. He jammed the wheels of their chariots so that they had difficulty driving. And the Egyptians said, let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them with Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and horsemen. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And at daybreak, the sea went back to its place. The Egyptians were fleeing toward it and the Lord swept them into the sea. The water flowed back and covered their chariots. The entire army followed. Not one of them survived. But the Israelites, they went through the sea on dry ground with the wall of water on their right and on their left. That day, the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. And when the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord, put their trust in him, and Moses, their servant. <clears throat> Be still and know that he is the Lord. Wait, and you will see what he will do. Deliverance is coming. How can he be so confident? How can Moses dare see those words? Because he does not have a map from the Lord of what's going to happen. He doesn't know. The Lord hasn't told him, don't worry, this is how this is going to go down. We're going to separate the waters, they're all going to go through. He doesn't know. He just knows, I trust the one who has guided us this far. He led us into this valley. I know that he will make a way where there seems to be no way. This pillar has guided their every step. By day, a cloud, by night, fire. It has never left them. In this crisis, we see that the pillar intentionally changes. It moves to their rear guard. The angel of the Lord separates the community from the enemy, creates a physical barrier of protection. I believe that it's purposeful that the miracle happened in the dead of night. In the daylight, we know that the Israelites' vision and viewpoint was filled with chariots, fear overwhelming them. They are coming down at us now. In the midnight hour, I can't see the enemy behind me. And we know that the Lord has his light is all that is guiding them in the front. So we have darkness behind. You cannot see the enemy. You don't even know if they're there. But there is a light that is going across the water. And the Lord is, take a step. Would you dare just take one step and then another and then another? The Lord is a light unto their path. It is purposeful that the Lord has come at the midnight hour, in the darkest of the night, in the midst of their fears, in the midst of their certainty of death. It is then that the Lord intervenes and delivers them. As you think about your last two years, how has the Lord broken in at your worst fears? Where has he intervened? How have you experienced his tangible deliverance in your life? In your health, provision, maybe you lost your job. 
in the midst of the pandemic, and he provided a new one. Protection? How have you experienced firsthand the Lord's deliverance? It is true for you. The Lord is the one who is unchanging in the midst of all the other changes. And it is critical that we speak and declare the ways that he has been the way maker, the one who has made a highway out of the seas, the one who has heard our cry and come in and said he is our refuge place. He is the one in the impossible situation that he has made a way. I'm going to create some space for you now to reflect on your story and how it intersects with the Israelites. I'm going to invite you to continue to press in on the question I asked at the beginning, to name some of the losses that are connected with Pastor Wayne's transition, what you're experiencing in this place with Lighthouse. Be as specific as you can. What will you miss? What is ending? And as we pull back, I'd also like you to capture how this transition has landed for you in the midst of this valley. You might want to turn, even in the booklet, I included, right, we included a picture of this. You label what have been the significant transitions in the last two years. I prompted you with some things, but there may be others. You need to name and understand how does this leadership transition fit in all the other things that have been going on in your life. You need to acknowledge that before the Lord. And then finally, to recognize the Lord did not leave you in this valley alone, but he's been intentional leading you to this place for his namesake so that he would be glorified in your midst that we can declare together the ways that he has led us, been a provider and a protector. You will have an opportunity in small groups to capture that on a post-it note, and we will fill our two pillars behind me. You might have wondered, what are these things? This is our pillar of fire, right? Can you see it now? And our pillar of cloud. So as small groups, you will fill these up. We will declare how has the Lord been leading us and guiding us and making a way where there seems to be no way. I'm going to give you about 10 minutes on your own. We're just going to stay here in this space. I understand there might be some music so that we're not distracted by folks kind of riding next to us. And then Josh will come back up. And he'll direct us and we'll have an opportunity to process and share in small groups and then fill our pillars. Amen? Let me just pray for you as you enter in. Jesus, thank you that you create a space of holy ground that is tender, even as we recall these last couple years or name the transition that we feel as Pastor Wayne transitions. And so Jesus, would you come, Holy Spirit, would you come and be the counselor and guide? Would you give us courage to name and put down what it's been like? Not so that we are overwhelmed by the anxiety, but that you can come in and speak. How is it? that you have met each of us individually and as a community in this valley. Reveal yourself to us, Lord, so that we can glorify you. Come now. Create a space for us to sit with you and hear your tender voice. I am here. I am for you. Look and see my deliverance. Amen.